we are in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. One of the synagogue officials has asked Jesus to come and heal his daughter who's on death's door. And so, as Jesus was going that way, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched me? Now, the disciples said, Jesus, you see the people crowding against you, and you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as you know, we're in our summer series of unbelievable moments in the Bible. And this one is a woman getting healed after a 12-year-long affliction. I, I was asked, what are you preaching on this week? And I said, the woman with the 12-year-long hemorrhage. And she responded, as a man, what makes you think you can identify with the misery of 12 straight years of bleeding? I knew I should have preached on Jonah. Sickness, it's the great interrupter of life. It enters in without knocking. It thwarts all of our plans. It diminishes our hopes. In fact, every part of our life seems to get touched by it. The loss of control, it's like hitting ice when you're in the car. It's a helpless feeling as all you can do is hold on and wait for the crash. And you go to work if. The sickness allows it. Even getting up in the morning is stipulated by your sickness. And when you're sick, you lose your identity. You kind of become defined by your illness. Uh, Don't we do that? Uh, She's got cancer and and he's got AIDS and uh, what's-a-face is struggling with depression. We're defined by our illness all of a sudden. And sickness has a way of impacting our social life. It puts strains on our jobs, on our hobbies, our relationships. It robs us of all of our resources, like this woman who spent all she had battling her sickness. Then comes the loss of hope. I mean, she tried everything, kind of like the way we will. We'll go searching for alternative um, treatments that almost border on quackery. You know, let's go down to Tijuana. Now, there's nothing in Tijuana that gives them that empty handed feeling. And, and the ancient cures, they range from carrying the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen bag, a, a white bag in the summer, and a, a darker bag in the winter, to carrying a barley corn found in the dung of a white donkey, to carrying around the tooth of a fox, to eating grasshopper eggs to carrying around the fingernail of a person who'd been hanged, you thought your HMO was bad. And and the woman in our story, she would constantly be weak, anemic, pale. She'd have no energy, always tired, beat down day after day, just trying to get up enough energy to attempt another day. I mean, we know what it's like to have a bad day, a rough month, maybe a a difficult season in life, but this would be the span of first to twelfth grade. Her life is literally draining out of her body, 
little by little. The Bible says God won't put you more through more than you can handle. Whew. This is a burden. If she had a husband, she probably lost one because touching her would defile him, which would mean she would be reduced to a life of begging for scraps for food from a distance. But her condition left her on the fringe of society. And imagine the emotional suffering. It'd be overwhelming to go from one rejection to another. And even worse, the Jewish law, according to Leviticus 15, says that she was spiritually unclean, which meant she was unable to approach God. I mean, even if she could hide the outward manifestations of her situation, the inner turmoil would be overwhelming. Cursed by God, silently, she bears it. Now, maybe you know what it's like to suffer from an ongoing situation. Could be a chronic illness. Could be a blood situation like a bleeding heart or an, ang- an inner angst of bad blood between you and somebody else. Sometimes that causes blood revenge as you keep working the offense over and over in your head. And ironically, this woman represents all those who live without Jesus who've been defiled by the blood disease they inherited from Adam, called sin. You know, people spend their lives searching for help for their condition, but they only get worse because they don't come to the source of life, Jesus. And how many of God's people are discouraged and defeated? Oh, we've tried everything in our power to handle our problems, and yet we're no better. Our life is as messed up now as it was then. And let's be honest, everybody has issues. It could be a chronic health situation. It could be a financial burden, social issues with your friends or family. And then there are the spiritual ones, a prayer that God hasn't answered yet, or a sinful situation that keeps weighing you down. And, and we try different remedies as Christians. But we go to the doctor morality to get God on God's good side, we, we live an upright life. We go to the doctor of happy feelings, and we try to maintain a spiritual high. We fill our heads with Christian books, Christian music, Christian seminars, Christian preachers. We go to the doctor of legality, strictly obeying all that the Bible says. We even try Dr. Church, going to church with our regular attendance, our participation, and giving. By the way, Uh, Giving is the only one that's really worked, okay? So for all these years of crying out to God, no doubt she lost faith, and then she would reattempt it and go through that cycle. Finally, the divine appointment has arrived. And, And really, it's a spiritual cold blue. You know, when it's beyond difficult and inconvenient and uncomfortable, I'm not talking about when the internet goes down or the AC quits working or it's a bad hair day. I mean, all of us, we want spiritual blessings. We want to pick me up. But when it's a life or death matter, when our marriage is hanging on by a thread, when you're about to crack emotionally, when you feel empty and don't think you can go on, it's in those desperate moments when we stretch and reach for God. I think most would have given up years ago, but this woman, she has the belief, if I just touch his robe, I'll be healed. You see, she's figured out who Jesus is and what he's capable of. Maybe she saw Jesus from a distance when he healed the leper. Or maybe she heard one of his invitations, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens, I will come in. If anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink the waters of abundant life. You know, that's the one good thing about troubles and problems. We become open to God. And I would imagine for this woman, it would take all the energy she had to struggle through the crowd. And then realize by stepping out in faith, She was taking a risk of being subject to public humiliation and ridicule. 
If anybody finds out she's in the crowd, it's going to be bad news for her. And, and so while all this bumping and shoving is going on around Jesus, she mixes in and she intentionally reaches out and touches his cloak. She was hoping to steal a blessing with no one seeing. And she grabbed his garment. And when she touched, she felt the healing radiate through her body. You know, this is the only miracle recorded in Scripture where no word was spoken or action displayed by Jesus. And, and her intention was to kind of slip away anonymously. But Jesus sensed that power had gone forth from him. Nobody noticed her except for him. He recognizes somebody tapped into the divine power made available. And so Jesus asked, who touched me? Peter cynically responds, you're surrounded by a mob and you ask who touched me? And then here's Peter talking to Almighty God this way. And in the midst of the bumping and jostling with the crowd, there was a touch with faith attached to it. Dread must have rolled through her as Jesus stopped and asked, who touched me? No doubt she was afraid that she was about to get chastised as her touch would have made Jesus ceremonially unclean until sundown. But Jesus wasn't interested in humiliating her. In fact, he wanted to give her more than a physical blessing. He wanted to restore her identity. You see, friends, there's another storyline going on simultaneously with this one. See, the synagogue official had asked Jesus to lay hands on his daughter who was close to death. And, and on the way to do this healing, they were interrupted by this sick woman. I mean, what an inconvenience. Time is of the essence. This detour that the synagogue official, as he's sitting on pins and needles, it, it caused his daughter to die. You know, I read the story, and we see what Jesus does, and it causes me to say, I wonder if, our interruptions in life, if those inconveniences that come our way should be reframed as a potential significant spiritual moment. Wouldn't that change our attitude? I mean, imagine the synagogue official. My daughter's on the brink of death, and, and this insignificant, unclean person, this woman unworthy of entering God's temple, is wasting our precious time. Friends, this uncared for, unwanted, cast out woman caught the eye of God because she reached out to him in faith. And I think Jesus wanted to teach the synagogue official that these people who don't fit into the Jewish law book, they're valuable and precious to God. Jesus is correcting his view of who's acceptable and who's important to God. And, and while you're asking me to heal your 12-year-old daughter, this anonymous woman suffering for 12 years is God's daughter, and God cares for her just as you care for your little girl. This might be a message for us to rethink the way we see the outcasts, the unwanted, and those who suffer. You know, this is the only time Jesus ever calls a female by the term daughter. And it's a word signifying relationship and belonging. See, friends, she got more than a physical healing. For 12 years, she's been an outcast, a nobody, dwelling in isolation and loneliness. But her touch brought her into the family of God. I read the story about a king who had a heavy stone placed in the middle of the roadway that all of his subjects would have to pass. And then he withdrew into the background to watch and see what would happen, to see if anybody would move the stone. And nobody did. Instead, they all blamed the king for not keeping the roadway clear. And finally, some poor peasant who was on his way to town to go to the marketplace to sell his vegetables, he comes upon the stone. He sees it's in everybody's way. He lays down all of his things and through great effort moves the stone off the pathway. And as he goes to pick up his stuff, he notices a purse was underneath the stone filled with gold and a note from the king, property of the one who moved the stone. You know, the woman experienced healing, not because she touched the garment, but because she 
he exercised faith in Jesus. I mean, there were dozens of people with physical, spiritual, and emotional needs in the crowd that day, but only one was transformed. She was willing to do whatever she had to to touch Jesus. And so many people, they just brush by the Lord, and they leave unchanged. All the while, he's got the power to change your situation every listen. You know, today's miracle is an oversplash of God's grace. She wasn't the focus of Jesus' attention. She wasn't on his agenda. She just incidentally crossed his path. And I want you to hear me. The touch of one anonymous woman on a street in a crowd activated the glory of God. The human touch has the power to engage the living God. My question for you is, have you reached out and touched him? Because, again, many are thronging around Jesus. And and really, friends, it's easy to be hanging around God and never actually touch him. You might say, well, how do I touch God? Friends, you enter into that conversation with him. And you believe that he cares about you. You open up the Bible. You read a chapter a day. And then you stay in that conversation. You open up your heart. You tell him what's on your mind. You hand over what's on your heart. You, you, you stay close, and all of a sudden, he starts guiding. He starts talking back. He starts moving around you. He starts sending people into your path. He starts opening opportunities. The supernatural comes alive. I want you to know, Jesus stopped for her, and he'll stop for you. But you need to get close to him. Jesus knows the difference between rubbing shoulders and someone touching with faith. Again, I want to say it. A lot of people enjoy being in the crowd without being intimate with Jesus. And they go home unchanged. You know, when I was a kid, my favorite car was the El Camino. Okay, it had this little cab with this nice little pickup truck. That's the car I wanted to have. You know, you could put your surfboard in the back. And in the front, there was one long bench. So... Your girlfriend, if I ever got one, would sit right there next to me. Kind of reminds me of the old couple driving down the road in their pickup truck. The woman said, remember when we used to sit right next to each other? He said, yes, but I haven't moved. (laughs) Are you drawing near? You know, before the era of mandatory seatbelts, you could always tell which couples were in love and which ones weren't by the distance in the car seat. And, and really, many of God's children were content to ride in the car with the Lord, but we kind of want to keep our distance. And friends, I want you to know that God's not interested in a legal contract with you. I mean, the legal side is important. Jesus died on the cross to justify you before God and place your name in the book of life. He declared you legally righteous because he transferred to you his sinlessness. But God wants more than that. There's a big difference between a legal marriage and an intimate relationship. And and an invitation is being extended to you to enjoy greater intimacy with God. You know, many people were in the crowd because they wanted to see the show. They wanted to see the, the, the synagogue official's daughter healed. But the woman, she wasn't interested in a parade. You could be in the vicinity. You can be in the environment, the neighborhood. And still miss the touch of God. Friends, I guess what I'm telling you today is, I don't want you to come to church and miss the opportunity for you and God to touch. There's power that can flow from God into our lives. And if you've been dealing with issues, now is the time to invite God into your circumstances. Instead of thinking about it and worrying about it and complaining about it, engage God and move in with that step of faith. Turn it over to Him so Satan doesn't have to ruin your life. You know, a signal man for the railroad was asked to meet the inspector at the signal box to take a test. And so the inspector said, what would you do if you realized that two trains were heading towards each other on the same track? The signal man said, 
I would switch one train to the other track. He said, what if the lever broke? He said, then I'd run down the tracks and use the manual lever down there. He said, what if it was struck by lightning? He said, then I'd run back up here and use the phone to call the next signal box. What if the phone was busy? Then I'd run up to the street level and, and use the public phone near the station. He said, what if it was vandalized? He said, in that case, I'd run to my Uncle Leo's house. Puzzled, the inspector said, why would you run to Uncle Leo's? He said, because he's never seen a train crash before. <laughs> Have you done all you could to overcome the barrier that get placed between you and God? Because the devil would love to get as many things and make it as hard as possible for you and God to have a touch. But God wants you to touch him. In fact, his hand is already reaching out to you. And if you're carrying a burden and you're feeling defeated, you don't have to anymore. Because relief from all issues is found in that touch with God. And even if you're living a failed Christian life, God has his eye on you and wants to free you from the chains that you've placed yourself in. I know a lot of folks say, oh, God doesn't have time for me. Friend, he will stop and respond to your touch. He's just waiting for you to reach out. Last thought of the day. Notice that she intended on touching Jesus and then slipping away. And Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. Who touched you? And, and what's amazing is her story is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Her story has become an inspiration to everybody. Friends, when God moves in our lives, he wants us to tell other people so that the folks in our sphere of influence will know that there's a God who loves them and cares about them. I want you to reach out and touch him. In fact, I want to take just a moment right now. Close your eyes. Let's go to that place. What is it where you want God to reach into your life and touch him? What relationship? fear of problems. An ongoing bad habit. What miracle do you want? Lord, as together we lift up to you what's on our hearts. We reach out knowing that you can, knowing that you're willing, and ask and invite you to reach down and touch us. Release your power. Change us. In the name above all names, we 